Hi, Dr. Teresa Lyons here, creator of Navigating Autism and Eat to Heal Autism. And this week's Ask Dr. Lyons question is about metabolic disorders, specifically folate metabolism. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about folate metabolism and the issues there are in the autism population. And it's something that is actually considered a comorbidity. So this week's question is, what works? And let's get right into the science. All right, let's get straight to the science of comorbidities. Comorbidity is defined as the simultaneous presence of two chronic diseases or conditions, and there are treatments for comorbidities. List of comorbidities, seizures and epilepsy, neurotransmitter disorders, sleep disorders, metabolic disorders. Today we're gonna to go over the first one, folate, immune disorders, and gastrointestinal disorders. I have videos on them, so please, if you're interested in a specific topic, look for that video as well. This video, we're diving deep into metabolic disorders, and we'll look at the first of six, which is folate. What is folate? You've also probably heard terms used interchangeably, such as folic acid and folate. Well, when you hear folate, just think food. Folate food. Folates are found in foods, and folic acid, it's actually more stable and occurs rarely in nature, but folic acid is the form most often used in vitamin supplements and fortified foods. That means our body has to do some extra work to process folic acid, whereas folates, they're found naturally in food and our body can process them a lot easier. One of the most important roles of folate is in energy production via the methylation cycle. So here there's a degradation of an excess amino acid and methionine in the liver and it breaks it down to homocysteine and then further gets broken down into sulfates and pyruvates and that's what's used in the Krebs cycle which is all about giving energy for the cell. So it's very complicated chemistry and just know that why folate is important is because eventually it deals with the energy of the cell. Folate metabolism. First, we need to talk about polymorphism. So polymorphism is a genetic variation that occurs commonly in the general population. It's not a mutation. So a mutation is a rare genetic change. A polymorphism is a genetic variation, not a mutation, a variation that occurs commonly in the general population. So in those with autism, many have a polymorphism that decrease both the production and transport of 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. It doesn't mean that everyone who has autism has this polymorphism. Reversely, those who have this polymorphism don't necessarily have autism. So it's a polymorphism. It's a genetic variation that occurs commonly in the general population. So let's look at polymorphisms in autism a little bit more. So there are other polymorphisms in the autism population and it's found in genes that code methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, dihydrofolate reductase, and reduced folate carrier. You can see folate is common in those three. Folate transport across the blood-brain barrier is also compromised in many with autism due to an inefficient folate receptor alpha, and it's inefficient many times because the body is producing autoantibodies to this receptor. If severe dysfunction persists, then cerebral folate deficiency occurs, right? Folate can't get into the brain because that transport across the blood-brain barrier is inefficient. And so if that happens, then it can lead to epilepsy, neurodevelopmental regression, autism, and other neurological abnormalities like spacity and movement disorders. There really can be a serious consequence to severe dysfunction of folate transport across the blood-brain barrier. And I realize this is getting very granular, 
right? We were talking about autism, we're talking about comorbidities, and now we're really focusing down to something very, very specific, such as folate. So we're really looking at one molecule. But if in your child there's a dysfunction with the processing of this one particular molecule, if it becomes a severe dysfunction, you can actually have severe outcomes from that. So it's important to understand. But please know that not everyone with autism is dealing with a folate dysfunction. So what's the big deal about folate? Reduced folate in the brain can cause central nervous system mitochondrial dysfunction. On the last slide, I listed certain outcomes that can happen if there is severe dysfunction, but reduced folate in the brain can also cause central nervous system mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's extremely worrisome because mitochondria, they govern many metabolic processes, one most importantly being the Krebs cycle. And so the Krebs cycle is really where the cells are getting energy. So you can see how if there is issues with processing folate in your child's body, it can really have some serious consequences. The really good news is that there are folate metabolism treatments. So let's get into that. Folates are common treatments for those with autism, but this is all new and it's not thoroughly documented. It's just being researched and this is really the beginning of understanding the relationship of a comorbidity of folate metabolism with autism. So folinic acid, and I did put dosage there, anywhere from 0.5 to 4 milligrams per kilogram per day, has been used as a supplement treatment, and it's been shown to improve and in some cases complete recovery of autism symptoms and other problems such as seizures. So those references there, references two and three, um, some of that work came out of Belgium, which showed complete recovery of autism symptoms based upon really understanding the child's body and if there were the autoantibodies to the folate receptor alpha. If there are high levels of that autoantibody, then folinic acid showed in this research to be pivotal in complete recovery of autism symptoms. Another way of reducing autoantibodies to folate receptor alpha is a dairy-free diet. So that's been shown in the research as well to reduce autoantibodies to the folate receptor alpha. And when you reduce those antibodies, then the folate receptor alpha becomes much more efficient. It can then transport folate across the blood-brain barrier. And again, this is all about having your child's body perform optimally at the cellular level. And this is two of the things that you can do. So there's folinic acid and there's also dairy-free diet. And for those who are like, what about bacteria? <laughs> Here you go. So there are folate-producing bacteria. So this is another way that our body can get folate is from the bacteria that we have in our gut. So bacteria that can produce folate. L. plantarum, WCSF1, that's commensal, as well as B. adocentis, DSM18350, that's actually a probiotic strain. And to go a little bit further, looking at the genomes of 256 human gut bacteria, 40 to 65% of those gut bacteria possess the ability to produce B vitamins. And the research, they were looking at eight different B vitamins. Folate is there in one of them. I'll be discussing some of the other B vitamins in other videos. But on, in this video, we just want to focus on folate. So it's absolutely, it's absolutely a tremendous fact to know that human gut bacteria, examining 256 of them, 40 to 65% possess the actual ability to produce B vitamins. So this is why finding the right special diet for your child is vital, right? The previous slide was talking about how dairy-free diets lower 
the autoantibodies for the folate receptor alpha. Here, this research shows that certain bacteria can produce folates. So there's a lot of special diets that can help, but you wouldn't want to just go dairy-free in some instances, depending on the symptoms of your child. And you wouldn't want to just add probiotics, right? It's all about finding the right special diet for your child. But these are the facts, and this is why special diets actually work. And if you want to read some more information, here are some references. And I hope you enjoyed this video.